I'm going to move, uh, move straight on very quickly because there is absolutely no time in hand in this debate. You take interventions, I'm afraid it comes out of your time. It's a debate on motion 9378 in the name of Liam MacArthur on justice. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move the motion. Eight minutes, Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I welcome the chance to open the debate on policing on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats in what is something of a double header for me this afternoon. Uh, as the, ch the Chamber will be aware, my party uh, didn't support the 2012 Act that created a single national police force. Over the last five years, we've also been at the forefront of holding the SNP government to account over its bought centralisation of policing in Scotland, and we make no apology for that. On stop and search, on armed policing, on failings within centralised control rooms and other issues, Liberal Democrats have been right to speak up and to challenge. Let me be clear, though. Police officers and staff carry out difficult, often dangerous jobs on our behalf day in, day out across Scotland. We owe them a debt of gratitude as we do all those in our emergency services and we have every confidence in them. I firmly believe, however, that passing the Police and Reform, uh, Fire Reform Act in 2012 has done them no favours at all. Yeah, yeah. So my colleague Alison McKinnison predicted during the passage of the bill that police officers and staff would be left to make the best of a bad job and she was right and they have been doing so ever since. And the root of the problems can indeed be traced back very directly to the legislation driven through this parliament by the then Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, a man quite happy to do the wrong thing for the right reason. Attempts by opposition parties to amend the legislation, taking account of the concerns felt not just by the public in terms of the loss of local accountability, but by officers and staff themselves, fell on deaf ears. Ministers, in the opinion of ministers, know best. To compound matters, Mr McCaskill then chose Sir Stephen House to head up the new national force, someone even less inclined uh, to build consensus or listen to others than the man who appointed him. Add to that a single police authority, the body tasked with overseeing the new force, which appeared unclear of its responsibilities, largely dysfunctional and prone to a culture of secrecy. Is it any wonder then that we've seen the problems we have over the last five years? Initially, there was the turf war between Police Scotland and the SPA. This forced Parliament to establish a subcommittee on policing, effectively to carry out the role that the SPA was fa failing to perform. Yeah. Those critical of what they see as the politicisation of the police and of policing should bear that in mind. It is the legislation and the flaws within it that have determined the level of political scrutiny. As for having confidence, this is hardly enhanced by a succession of resignations, suspensions and early retirements at the top of both Police Scotland and the SPA. I accept, of course, that the leading protagonists have changed. Michael Matheson, I know, is more consensual than his predecessor. Indeed, his primary role over the first couple of years in office appeared to be putting out all of the fires that Mr <laughs> McCaskill had been willfully igniting in his scorched earth policy. I also have the utmost respect for the acting Chief, Chief Constable and the new chair of the SPA, Susan Deacon, whose appointment I very much welcome. However, we've been here before. We've heard the promises about resetting relationships. Fundamentally, as the motion suggests, until we get the structure right, until we address the flaws that have been hardwired into the system by the 2012 Act, we're setting up those who take on these senior roles to fail. Meanwhile, rank and file officers and staff are still left having to make the best of a bad job. Funding, of course, is key, and I welcome the recent decision in relation to VAT, but this was a mess of the government's own making, where they were warned in advance and then throughout. Meantime, as Audit Scotland has highlighted repeatedly, the vaunted efficiencies that Mr McCaskill and the SNP heralded as justification for centralisation have simply not materialised. So we are left with an organisation in financial distress operating in a structure that is not fit for purpose. That structure has eroded genuine local accountability, as Liberal Democrats have warned from the outset, replacing it with a top-down, target-driven approach to policing. While well, areas of specialist expertise are absolutely essential, this is not in of itself a reason for taking a sledgehammer to the way policing is delivered in communities across Scotland. By way of illustration, only last month, a member of the Protective Services and Community Safety Committee in Fife had her request for Police Scotland to provide a report on a local murder turned down by the SNP chair. 
in his opinion, she could just get the information from uh, watching FMQs on the BBC iPlayer. So much for local accountability. At the same time, unprecedented power has been invested in a small handful of indiv individuals. All hail to the chief carries risks, and not only when the chiefs are Kenny McCaskill and Stephen House. The checks and balances have not worked. The concerns are brushed aside, at least initially, with the high-handed arrogance that comes from a lack of proper accountability. When reports emerged of industrial levels of unregulated stop and search, including of small children, ministers insisted that this was an operational mass matter for police chiefs. Public concerns about armed police on routine duties were dismissed by go government as scaremongering. So too were warnings about overstretched staff following closure of police control rooms. The deaths of Lamar Bell and John Ewell in the crash in the M9 brought home the sobering reality. It is an article of faith for Liberals that power is most safely exercised when it is shared. Our current structure of policing cuts against the very grain of that principle. We do not have confidence in those structures and we need change. Scottish Liberal Democrats want to see a comprehensive, properly funded policing plan for each local authority area developed and agreed by communities and councillors and the responsibility of a senior police officer. Yeah, yeah. SPA members appointed by this parliament on a two-thirds majority to ensure a balanced and uh, representative authority and sensibly diluting the control of the Justice Secretary. The powers of the Chief Constable defined in statute reflecting the need for new democratic checks and balances. The aim is to inject democracy back into our policing. These are our proposals, but a broader, con a broader consensus must be built, which is why we propose an independent commission. I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. Would you accept that when I was a councillor in Glasgow and we had with we Clyde Police, I had no influence whatsoever or involvement in the police apart from a local level? Liam McArthur. Well, I can't speak to the specifics of uh, John Mason's experience as a councillor, but the, the, the message back from councillors, the length and breadth of the country that I have spoken to, is that what they've seen is a dilution of the uh, accountability that they had uh, previously. And I think the illustration I gave them from Fife uh, points to that very, very directly. Commissions can provide mature, thoughtful, expert responses. There have been game changers before. They've got this government out of holes before. Just think what would have happened had SNP ministers rejected our call to press pause on plans to abolish corroboration, allowing Lord Bonamy's commission to do its work. Without the commission led by John Scott, we would still be seeing the police deploying extensive, unregulated stop and search. This is the kind of reset that Police Scotland needs. We have every confidence, Deputy Presiding Officer, in our police officers and staff. We have no confidence, though, in the structures they're being asked to operate within. Yeah. We need change. I move and urge Parliament to support the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr MacArthur. I now call Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary, to speak and move Amendment 978.46. Minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Last week, I outlined the significant journey that policing in Scotland has been on to implement one of the most significant public sector reforms since devolution. The legislation agreed by this Parliament to establish Police Scotland was supported by both the Labour Party and also by the Conservative Party. Let us remind ourselves that this was delivered in the context of real terms cuts to the Scottish Budget by the UK Government, a process started by the last Tory Lib Dem coalition. And of course, these cuts have been further amplified by the intransigence of the part of the UK Government when it came to the VAT treatment of our emergency services. In government, the Lib Dems were happy to deliver a Treasury windfall of £125 million pounds at, the, at the expense of Scotland's police service. Members will recall the former Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Danny Alexander, of course now Sir Dian Danny Alexander, declined all of our attempts to reclaim the VAT and even refused to engage with the Scottish Police Federation on this very issue. So, President Officer, when the Lib Dems talk about pressures on our police service, they should take a good look at themselves, given the financial pressures that they helped to create when in government. The choices we faced in creating Police Scotland was one of transforming to protect the front line or allowing the front line to wither due to austerity. I remain in no doubt that we have chosen the right course. Our communities continue to be served by committed local officers, whilst the single service has opened up access to a set of 
national specialist capabilities that allow us to respond more effectively to some of the most difficult societal problems we face, be it terrorism, child protection, major investigations into complex crime, human trafficking or extremism. Sound officer, the legislation passed by this parliament also established the Scottish Police Authority and the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner to provide a level of scrutiny that simply did not exist previously. It is my belief that policing is more transparent and accountable than it has ever been. I recognise that major reform always brings challenges. Nevertheless, policing in Scotland continues to perform well. Against a host of measures, be it recorded crime or public confidence, it's clear that policing remains strong. A point recognised by DCC Ian Livingston, the Scottish Police Federation and the Chief Inspector of Constabulary in recent weeks. Of course, President Officer, policing is a complex service and supports a large number of vulnerable people, many of whom are in crisis situations. The people dealing with those situations are our police officers and staff, and they do a remarkable job. In that context, I believe it's important that we are able to move on to a more mature and honest debate about the realities of policing and the risks that it carries, however it is structured. As many policing experts with long experience have also highlighted, there were many challenges and many difficulties under the legacy arrangements, a point that some choose to ignore. Of course, that is not to say that there aren't things that we can learn and improve. I accept, for example, the importance of strengthening the community focus of our police service, recognising that one size does not fit all. That's why it's a key theme of the strategic policing priorities implemented last year and is core to the Policing 2026 strategy published in June of this year. That strategy sets a clear direction for policing and I'm committed to supporting the Deputy Chief Constable Ian Livingston and his team with its implementation. Progress has also been made to improve governance and transparency at the SPA following a review by HMICS earlier this year. The review of the authority's executive function is in its final stages and will deliver a new model for how the board can be supported more effectively. Kenneth Hogg has taken up post as new chief officer and Susan Deacon has taken up her role as chair of the authority this week with this parliament playing a direct role in her appointment. The new chair has made clear that she intends to make the authority much more engaged and engaging when it comes to the public debate around policing in Scotland and to take a more inclusive approach to governance matters. Then officer, I believe our collective focus should be on supporting Police Scotland and its executive team, the SPA board and the wider policing family in Scotland to assist them in driving forward further improvements and to make sure that we build on the progress that's been made to date. I believe that's an approach that will deliver real benefits quickly rather than the uncertainty that would be created by another review of policing structures in Scotland. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I call Liam Kerr to speak to move amendment 978.1. Mr Kerr, five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives will support the Liberal Democrat motion at decision time this evening, but also put forward an amendment in my name, which I hereby move. At the outset, let me make clear that when we support the motion's reference to structure, we are referring to the Act uh, and why it should be reviewed. I am interested today in the structure and historic shape of policing in Scotland and not operational challenges which may have arisen recently. Things could always be better and it is important that we look constructively towards the future. The governance structure referred to in the motion is a function of the Police and Fire Reform Act of 2012 which established a Scottish police authority to maintain policing, promote policing principles and continuous improvement of policing and to hold the Chief Constable to account. The SPA was conceived as an apolitical, arms-length body sitting between policing and central government, which would provide national strategic oversight and accountability of the single police force. The board would be appointed on the basis of their specific skills to create an epistocracy. Yet it is that act and certain decisions that have followed which have effectively hardwired flaws into the structure. 
Specifically, the only explicit reference to accountability in the Act is framed as a duty to hold the Chief Constable to account. It does not go on to specify how and is not prescriptive, meaning the SPA has struggled to establish a performance framework or a set of criteria against which to achieve that end game. That itself is a function of certain vagueness and ambiguities inherent in the previous system which it borrowed from. And what has developed, according to research, is a board which lacked confidence to raise or address issues of public concern and was described by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland as dysfunctional with fundamental weaknesses. Uh, not on that time scale, I'm afraid, Mike. Mike rumbles. Uh, it was criticised for conducting financial scrutiny in private, in contrast to the transparency and accountability required. And it is that very transparency and accountability which is hindered by the 2012 Act, which confers considerable power on the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. It is that post holder from time to time who appoints the chair of the SPA and influences the final composition of the SPA board. It is that act which gives Scottish ministers formal powers to give certain directions to the SPA. Now, amongst some, there is a perception that the SPA is an extension of the Scottish Government. And in answer to John Mason's point earlier, whether or not that is accurate, it is an unhealthy perception. Policing operates by collective public consent, and the public have to know that those in whom they trust are operating free from political influence. And specifically, in April 2017, it was reported that an SPA board member had quit over, quote, government interference. Brian Barber said that the government received SPA board documents before they were published in a bid to, quote, control the agenda and ensure difficult issues never made the light of day. Senior SPA figures complain the government is too involved with one individual claiming Every time we try to bite, the government removes a tooth. I've been shocked at the level of government interaction. And the former chair stated that the SPA was not a watchdog, as it has no powers of sanction. This has meant that other stakeholders, such as the Justice Subcommittee, the media and the public, have been seeking to deliver accountability. Now, the motion proposes a solution to establish an independent commission with a view to presenting proposals for change by summer 2018. Now, that seems sensible to me as decisions and considerations such as this should not be driven by politics and politicians, but independent evidence-led reviews. And for that reason, we'll find it difficult to support the SNP amendment absent that commitment. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to perhaps address that in, in closing to make it easier for us. Uh, turning to the Conservative amendment, the public like more locally accountable policing. Too many people now believe that policing decisions are dictated from above rather than decided in their own communities. So let's ask the experts how to restore that local accountability in the current financial and resource climate and with the nature of crime changing. The final part of our amendment acknowledges that the force is in the midst of what DCC Livingston calls difficult days. Now, whatever the reasons, this will be a disruptive and challenging time for frontline officers and staff. And I think it's vital that we in this parliament show we are 100% behind our police and we are proud of our dedicated officers and staff. The excellence of police officers and staff on the ground is no excuse for the clear structural failings which need fixings. And I urge the Justice Secretary to not use their professionalism as a shield to any legitimate criticism of the structure of the force which his government created. We all have a common interest in getting this sorted and getting this right. We owe it to the public and we owe it to the police. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Claire Baker to speak to move amendment 978.3. Five minutes, please, Ms. Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'm pleased to take part in today's debate. I won't address all the amendments in my opening statement as I have a short time, but I will set out the reasons for Labour's amendment. I would like to begin by putting on record um, our appreciation for the work of all officers and staff within Police Scotland. While we scrutinise and sometimes criticise and hold the government to account over the legitimate concerns that have been over policing in recent years, including call handling, stop and search, front desk closures, the officers and the staff often working in difficult circumstances should be recognised for their commitment and their degree of public service. But there is no denying this has been a bad year for leadership within Police Scotland and at the SPA. We have seen resignations, early exits and now suspensions. And while the Scottish Government and the leadership at Police Scotland and the SPA have to answer for the difficulties we have seen in recent months, we have to ask if there are more fundamental issues here to be addressed. Scottish Labour supported the creation of the single police force. 
We recognise the benefit to communities across Scotland in having a national force that provides specialised officers and support wherever it is needed. And this has to be balanced by a commitment to local <coughs> policing, which too many people feel is currently being compromised. However, recognising the benefits of a single force does not and should not restrain us from raising legitimate concerns over the way in which police reform has developed and some of the problems that have arisen. I can see some merit in the motion's call for an independent commission, though I do have some concerns over timing and remit. While not questioning the integrity of a single force, there are areas concerning governance, accountability and autonomy that need to be addressed. The passage of the Police and Fire Reform Act was rushed and concerns were raised at the time around democratic accountability, local oversight and the appointment process. I accept that the bill was passed and I voted for that bill, but the experience of living with the legislation for five years indicates the need for revisiting in these areas. Audit Scotland, HMICS and the two parliamentary committees have all identified weaknesses in leadership and management. In the last Parliament, as Labour's Justice Spokesperson Graham Pearson published a review into policing, building on some of the concerns that were growing over local accountability and leadership. This review made a number of recommendations that are still relevant two years later. These include greater parliamentary oversight, better local accountability and a stronger, more robust SPA. In that light, I welcome the appointment of Susan Deakin in her role as Chair of the SPA. Her interview on Sunday was very encouraging and I don't doubt her intention to lead a more transparent organisation. But I would argue that she is hamstrung by structures that she cannot change. And while no one doubts the ability and experience of Kenneth Hogg, the arrangement that he is a civil servant seconded for a year does little to diminish claims of government interference and overreached influence, all factors highlighted by the recent research from Dr Ali Malik. The SPA needs to regain the public's confidence, it needs to demonstrate that it is robustly autonomous from government and it is robust in its scrutiny of Police Scotland. It has an important role to play and in recent months it has become the story rather than doing its job effectively. It can be argued that part of this problem is who it is accountable to. The appointment of Susan Deakin was the first with some limited parliamentary involvement and I recognise the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to compromise in this and the First Minister also said she was not unsympathetic to the argument. With this new appointment in place, we must now look at the legislation and consider how Parliament can play a full role in future appointments. The current arrangements concentrate power for policing in the Scottish Government. And President Officer, I understand I have five minutes, just to clarify. I have five. <laughs> so you were, you were indicating that I was... Keep going. To, okay, thank you. Um, the current arrangements concentrate power for policing with the Scottish Government. It is they who appoint the SPA chair, who then in turn appoints the Chief Constable, and it is the Scottish Government who has the capacity to influence the final composition of the board. It's also the Government that gives directions to the same board, stretches the strategic priorities for the police and approves the SPA's strategic police plan. It should then be no surprise that we hold the Cabinet Secretary responsible for any problems at Police Scotland. The SPA needs to recognise its role as a public body and be able to exert itself in its responsibilities. The controversies that saw the exit of Andrew Flanagan and John Foley must not be repeated. And whilst I welcome the reintroduction of public committee meetings, there are still concerns over closed working groups that do not publish membership, minutes, papers or agendas. This may suit the SPA, it may even suit the Scottish mm -hmm. Government and the Justice Secretary, but this lack of transparency does not benefit the SPA or Police Scotland. Our amendment today recognises the weaknesses both in the way governance, accountability and leadership have developed and the ways in which it's stipulated within the legislation. A commission could be the way to go on this, but it would need a level of agreement in Parliament about the purpose. And judging from the number of amendments we have today, I don't think we're there yet. But I would ask members to reflect on addressing some of these issues. It does require legislative change and we shouldn't be timid in addressing that. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on John Finney to speak to and move Amendment 9378.2. Four minutes, Mr Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I, I do move that motion in my name. And I, I pose a question to colleagues around the Chamber, and that is, do they remember the times before Police Scotland when everything was good and there was no issues about policing? Now, if your answer to that is yes, then your memory's failed you, you don't know, or you're misrepresenting. The policing is a core element of any liberal democracy, and I was proud to have served as a police officer for 30 years. So I have to tell you, I take grave exception, not to everything, but to some passage in the Liberal Democrats' motion, which is an overt attack on Police Scotland. And that is, and I'll read it to you, that the Parliament does not have confidence in the structure of Police Scotland, 
to deliver resilient policing at a strategic level. Well, if you don't, then you've, you, you, that is extremely disappointing. And you Can have I to understand say to members, don't answer questions across the chamber. Make a, a formal intervention. Uh, I do beg your pardon. Um, the, the reality is that, of course, people are entitled to their opinion, but of all things, of all aspects of policing for the Liberal Democrats to focus this on, on the strategic level, um, I find peculiar. Organised crime, human trafficking, terrorism. No, I won't take an intervention. Um, no, I won't take an intervention. Organised crime, human trafficking and terrorism are the very elements that individual forces weren't able to deal with and were required to be dealt with collectively. So our motion states that there's an unarguable element that uh, the strategic element of Police Scotland is, uh, is sound. But of course, most people's experience of policing is, is local. Uh, and uh, I've been very critical of many aspects of policing. It's not, not least the stop and search debacle that's been referred to by many. Um, and the role that uh, Stephen House played in that, I actually think he was the right man to drive things forward initially, but of course when he saw the rest of Scotland being a larger version of Strathclyde and policies which are applicable to urban areas being applied in rural areas, then quite frankly it lost it. So there has been some uh, progress on uh, local policing methods, but of course, as our motion talks about as well, the frailty of the growing deployment of um, armed officers was another um, failing. And actually, it was cynical opportunism by uh, the police at the time there. Um, but I'm confident, I'm confident it wouldn't or couldn't happen again. Um, because I think we do learn from our mistakes. And one aspect that reassures me in relation to that is the consultation that's required to take place between Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority about any significant community impacts. Of course, all along, people had said there should have been a community impact assessment of the implications of the rollout um, so errors are sorted along the way and we have some way to go. One of the biggest errors latterly was the obsession with a figure, an arbitrary figure, 7234, 17,234, which was um, a burden round the neck of Police Scotland and meant that we lost a lot, lot of valuable police staff um, with the post being backfilled. So the romantic notion that everything was good is completely along and the, um, because, quite frankly, there was an inability to scrutinise. We heard from John Mason, that certainly was the experience some other places. And there was an inability to scrutinise, not because there was an unwillingness to scrutinise, because at some strategic levels, people on the police board, through no fault of their own, did not have the necessary level of clearance with which to scrutinise. Complaints against chief officers in the former forces were an absolute joke, and I speak from personal experience, where decisions were taken out with committee on matters which would have seen junior officers um, being the subject of a report to the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. So it's been mentioned made of the parliamentary role, yes, um, the parliamentary role of the police subcommittee, and I think it's played a pivotal role in addressing some of these issues. There's a way to go, and I'll hope to catch that in my summing up. Thank you very much. Please move your amendment. I did, but I will move it again. Thank you. Thank you. Open debate, speeches, tight, tight speeches, four minutes, please. Alec Cole Hamilton, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The centralisation of Police Scotland was opposed by this party almost in isolation, and we now stand vindicated in that opposition. Through the litany of failures and missteps by the High Command of Police Scotland that have undermined policing in this country since its merger, in the subterranean morale of our hard-working frontline police officers and in the decimation of backroom support staff which has seen treble nine call, calls go unheeded and, back, uh, and beat cops repeatedly taken off task to perform backroom functions. The recent high profile and shambolic travails in the upper echelons of the unified force are just the latest in a long list of disasters to have rocked policing in this country. And I see the social cost of this flawed legislation that underpins it in the casework that comes in through my constituency surgeries, in the meetings I have with local police chiefs, and even in the way we lock up our house at night. Because despite an insistence from the government that community level policing would remain unchanged, we immediately, from 2013 onwards, felt the irresistible gravitational pull of Strathclyde policing culture on Edinburgh beats. And straight out of the traps, we saw a major shift in the way that policing happens on the streets of our nation's capital. 
dedicated housebreaking teams were broken up and retasked to focus on responding to a spectre of knife crime which had never actually taken hold in this city. A decision which led then, perhaps unsurprisingly, to an epidemic in house burglaries and car thefts. An uptick which has endured to this day with a rash of break-ins in my own community of Blackhall just this past week. Policing of the sex industry was also brought into question where the soft regulation of tolerance zones and licensed saunas in Edinburgh, which retained a focus on keeping workers safe, was challenged by Police Scotland with a zero tolerance approach. This could have driven the industry back into the shadows and removed the protections offered to the by the city to sex workers. Glasgow solutions brought Edinburgh problems. This was symptomatic of the reality that for Police Scotland, with its newfound size, came an inflated sense of power. Liam MacArthur has already described the worst excesses of that in the refusal of the Chief Constable to recognise the will of Highland Council in its opposition to armed officers routinely patrolling Highland communities. Presiding officer, this attitude undermined the principle of policing by consent in this country and by so doing fundamentally damaged the social contract which has existed between the police and our communities for a hundred years and more. And four years on, the government is still trying to get this right. Now, I like Susan Deacon, I'm impressed by her, but her appointment represents just another roll of the dice in efforts by the SNP to fix flawed legislation and organizational structure mm -hmm. with the introduction of a personality. But for as long as the precepts which underpin centralization remain unchallenged, the future, uh, the culture and flawed structures will continue to blight that founding vision. So I'm proud to stand with my colleagues today in calling for reform, for reform is certainly needed. We need to get to a space where local communities and councils can once again determine and set the objectives and priorities of local policing. Where the police authority is democratically appointed by this parliament and where the powers of the police constable are anchored in statute, thereby simult simultaneously restoring and guaranteeing that most liberal principle of policing by consent in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart McMillan, followed by Maurice Corrie. Mr McMillan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, first of all, the Lib Dems have been consistent with their position against the formation of Police Scotland. We all understand their position on that, and we all understand the continual questioning of aspects of Police Scotland, some of which is in the motion today. However, the absolute negativity that they regularly espouse does not highlight the positives of delivery with, from our police officers across the country. The constant attacks do not help morale. Uh, if an organisation is continually told it is failing, it isn't working and isn't delivering, then it's no surprise that if people in that organisation were to believe that they aren't valued. And certainly John Finney, in his contribution a few, a few moments ago, spoke uh, of certainly some of the positive aspects of the formation of police Scotland. Uh, and I, I would encourage the Liberal Democrats to listen to, to actually want to go back and look at the official report of some of the comments from John Finney. Officer, I value our police officers and everyone involved in, in Police Scotland. Are there challenges? Absolutely, yes, there are. But there were challenges with the previous forces as well. And there are also challenges in every single organisation. The creation of Police Scotland was always going to be challenging. This huge level of public sector reform was going to highlight some issues. And some uh, of the, the things that have happened uh, are, are being investigated, as we know, and so I'm not going to get into that area. But, however, clearly the creation of Police Scotland has been more successful as some of us in this chamber actually want the, the rest of the country to believe. Now, I thought that Callum, Steele's, uh, Callum Steele of the Scottish Police Federations, I thought his Twitter post this morning provided clarity and a complete dismantling of the Lib Dem position today. And also, so I've only got four minutes, I've only got four minutes. Also, David Hamilton, uh, the Vice Chair of the Scottish Police Federation, who criticised the Lib Dems for the motion, which links two unrelated misconduct matters with a structure necessitated by austerity, brought about when they, the Liberal Democrats, were in government. The Scottish Government has put, it's going to put an extra £100 million into the budget by 2021, and despite the huge cuts to its budget from the UK Government uh, under the previous uh, Conservative Liberal Democrat administration, and now under the current Conservative UK Government. And even more could have been put in if the Lib Dems, when they were in coalition government uh, with the Tories, actually scrapped the VAT, if they'd have done something about that. Uh, certainly, presiding officer, uh, the case, uh, the, 
I have already said I will have no exchanges. You come and speak through the chair with interventions. Okay. Uh, presenting officer, so the Liberal Democrats uh, have been carping from, from the sidelines, where, whereas when they actually were in power in Westminster, they could have done something about the VAT issue, and they could have, which would have meant more money going into police at Scotland. If the Lib Dems were so concerned about the finances of police Scotland, then why didn't they do something about it? Presenting officer, there are successes with the, the formation of Police Scotland. Recorded crime is at its lowest level in 43 years. Uh, there have been 238,651 crimes were recorded in 2016-17. That's the lowest number on record since 1974. And also the, the crime risk is lower in Scotland uh, as compared to England and Wales, 14.5% compared to 15.9%. And also, uh, since 2008-09, cash back for communities money, £75 million has been in to help organisations to help young people uh, across the country. That's delivering uh, some nearly 2 million activities and opportunities across Scotland. Signing off, sir, uh, the main frustration I've got, uh, certainly with uh, Police Scotland, is we keep on losing, and Inverclyde, we keep on losing our divisional commanders. But that happened under Strathclyde Police as well. So this motion in front of us by the Liberal Democrats, once again, is absolute utter nonsense. Support Police Scotland, support the police officers that we actually have, because th it's the Liberal Democrats who are actually reducing their morale. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Corrie. <coughs> thank you, Deputy Designing Officer. It's important that the public have full confidence in their police forces and at all levels from the local, local officer doing the rounds in the streets to the very top levels of management in the police force. For them to have that confidence in their police force, the public needs to know that a structure and framework is in place that will give the police force the best chance to succeed. It is also the very least our hard-working frontline officers and staff deserve. As Liam MacArthur's motion notes, that the current system clearly is not working and what we need to do is to look at it again. And that is why the call for the establishment of an independent commission to look into this is a welcome suggestion and why we shall call, while I shall join my um, Conservative colleagues in supporting the motion and in supporting Liam Kerr's amendment as well. The reason for Liam, Liam Kerr's amendment is that the importance principle is that decisions need to be made local to those whom they affect. And that is why, in my opinion, an important part of a Commission's work will be to tell us how we can better put the local communities back at the heart of policing in Scotland. Putting local accountability at the heart of everything in Police Scotland does and should be central to its future core structure and governance. Far too many people in Scotland feel that policing decisions are dictated from above by a centralised bureaucracy who does not care for their opinions or thoughts rather than decided in their own local communities. And that is, that is because what the public see is thousands of officers being taken off the street to become part of a national and regional or regional resources. Figures show that some police divisions have lost up to as much as 30% of their officers. This in turn has led to a reduction in the ability of local officers to be adaptable to local needs and focus on key local priorities. And what the public also sees is figures like Callum Steele of the Scottish uh, Police Federation say that the police force, and I quote, risks being seen as walking away from certain elements of the communities whilst we talk about chasing other parts of it. The public sees that crime affects those in our society with the least most. The risk of being a victim of crime in the 15% most deprived areas of Scotland remained unchanged between 2012 and 13 and 2014-15. It is estimated that around 4.4% of adults experience 58% of all crime in Scotland. It is important that we make policing accountable again, and the Scottish Conservatives have offered solutions as to how we could do that, such as Margaret Mitchell's uh, suggestion about changing the way they chair, uh, that the chair of the SPA is selected. Making police accountable in, is particularly important whilst we have a government that, government that won't accept any responsibility for the failures in the system they created. And I believe that the government and those who manage the police, like all public sector organisations, need to be answerable to those whom they serve. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is vital that we look and, and bring local accountability back to policing in Scotland so that the public can once again rebuild their trust in the management of their police force. Thank you. Thank you. Call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms Bailey, please. Presiding officer, it's true to say that when we passed the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act in 2012, there were concerns raised then about implementation, even from people who supported the principle of reform. Now, two chief constables later, 
two chairs of the police authority gone, one chief executive having taken early retirement, and a number of high-profile suspensions. It appears to be an organization um, in a degree of turmoil. And make no mistake, that is having an impact throughout the police force. The local policemen and women that I speak to in my community, they are demoralized. They're on the front line, keeping us safe, protecting us from crime. But we keep asking them to do even more with even fewer resources. And that simply cannot continue because they need and deserve our support. Now, ultimately, this is the Scottish Government's responsibility. Um, and in doing so, let me, let me just say a word about so-called political interference. It is undoubtedly the case that there is more scrutiny of the police and is not, in my view, a bad thing for there to be more accountability. This should be embraced. But the Scottish Police Authority that was supposed to have oversight of Police Scotland and ensure that it was accountable has been disappointing to say the least. Their own lack of accountability, poor governance structures were exposed in a recent Audit Scotland report. Reports of secret meetings, little transparency, inappropriately targeting board members for being disloyal when they were simply asking questions. The list goes on. And when before the public audit committee of this parliament, the chair and chief executive displayed an extraordinary level of arrogance and complacency. Now, the Sc Scottish Police Authority was set up to be the arm's length body between Police Scotland and the Scottish Government to ensure their accountability and also the independence of the police from government. Instead, we hear it's been bypassed by the Cabinet Secretary. We have members of the board reporting that the board was useless, toothless, a waste of time, and the perception and the threat that if they were to upset the Chief Constable, then the Cabinet Secretary would intervene to stop them. The Public Audit Committee heard directly about interference by civil servants on behalf of the Cabinet Secretary. So it sounds like the Cabinet Secretary is hands-on when he shouldn't be, but when it matters, he is sometimes described as posted missing. It is true to say that Police Scotland has not had its problems to seek. Recent reports about mistakes in call handling, the lack of speed in response, have of course been concerning. But all of that said, I am not in favour of a commission. I think it distracts from getting on with the job now. Now, we have a new chair of SPA, known to many of us, Susan Deacon, um, a former MSP. We have an acting chief constable, both of whom I have absolute confidence in. Derek Penman at HCMIS made significant recommendations about what needed to change at SPA. Let's implement them. There is at least one review underway um, about support for the SPA board. And my former colleague, Graham Pearson, who has been a senior ranking police officer, also conducted a review in 2015. Not surprisingly, his review recommended strengthening accountability, transparency, and autonomy. The issues he raised then are issues that we face now. Finally, presiding officer, we do have a Justice II subcommittee. I would be interested to know whether they would consider undertaking post-legislative scrutiny, because at the end of the day, I have enormous respect, as we all do, for the police and what they do, especially those in ill division in my area. But the issue is how we support them, how we resource them, and to be frank, we need to do much better at that. Uh, thank you very much, Fulton McGregor, the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McGregor. Thank you, <clears throat> President Officer. And it is disappointing that the Liberal Democrats are using the current situation to attack the entire police force, and I agree with what John Finney has said, because that is what this motion is. And for someone usually very constructive on committee, and Liam MacArthur, um, I, I feel that this uh, motion is beneath him. To use the alleged, and let's uh, be clear, yet unproven actions of a handful of senior officers in this manner, trying to tar the entire force is shameful and, as I said, beneath the business of the Liberal Democrats. I completely agree with the new chair of the SPA, Susan Deacon, who said on Sunday that she takes the issue, she takes issue with the notion that our police service is itself in crisis. I also agree with DCC Livingston, who asked for, a, a, for the service to be apolitical and not be part of a political debate pushed around within a debate. It's incredibly unhelpful for anyone to jump in this issue and try and make it political. It damages the reputation of the police force and has a direct impact on the frontline officers who put their lives on the line for us every single day. Of course, there are challenges, as people have said, in bringing eight forces together. 
but the stats speak for themselves. Crime is at a 40-year low, year low. People feel safer now than ever before. And the risk of being a victim of crime is 14.5%, down from 20.4% in 2009. A single force allows the amalgamation of railway policing, for example, into a force allowing faster response to incidents on our railways. And these are just some of the positives and stats which this motion seeks to ignore. I have some sympathy with uh, John Finney's uh, motion, uh, where he's coming from, with regards to armed officers and the concern in our communities at seeing officers patrolling while armed. And having said that, I understand a recent survey uh, so survey um, of, of people saw a majority state that they would prefer their serving officers to be armed. I'm not for a minute suggesting that is the right route to progress. I've got my own views on that as well, but I do think it's something that needs more discussion um, and was worth reflecting on because it was in John Finney's uh, motion. The Liberal Democrats talked about localised policing, and I know that they don't have any representation in Lanarkshire, so I'm going to give them a little bit of info for what's going on in my area specifically, because I am also all about local policing and what's best, accountability and decision-making locally. The Divisional Commander, Chief Superintendent Roddy Irvin, has set up a local sol problem-solving team throughout Lanarkshire, good old-fashioned community policing. Each team led by an inspector, with support of a sergeant, two constables are assigned to each local authority ward area, and in my constituency, there are an extra two assigned for the town centre. Early indications are that these teams are having a positive impact locally, and I would suggest that the Liberals actually spend some time finding out what's happening on the ground, rather than just picking up stats. And it, the, these officers engage with MSPs, councillors, and a wide range of stakeholders. And actually, because I do have contact uh, with a, a lot of local councillors, I decided to very quickly, um, when Lee MacArthur was speaking, text in a WhatsApp group to them to ask them um, what their thoughts on the policing service were. And almost right away, I got responses. Councillor Kirsten Larson, very good at working with us and fostered a good relationship between councillors, police and the community. Councillor Tracy Carragher, local police in Coatbridge South are very accessible and I'm currently working with them towards a joint surgery. That's real life councillors. Minutes ago, given that indication, not just, um, just within, within minutes. That's local policing, that's how it's working locally. And I would ask everybody to get behind the local police. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Closing speeches, Colin John Finney to close to the Greens. Four minutes, please, Mr Finney. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. It, it has been an interesting debate, as many would have predicted. C can I say, I, I don't doubt for one second the sincerity of my Liberal Democrat colleagues in wanting to make things better. What I would say is that um, everything isn't about structure. Everything isn't about structure. I, I accept the position that you adopted, um, but I, I, I would like you to join with everyone else in playing your part at, at, at not appearing to question the uh, operational effectiveness of Police Scotland because everything suggests that they are effective. I think the, the criticism of the Scottish Police Authority is well documented and, and, and entirely merited. But th that said, Ms Deacon takes over and I, I wish her very well. I, I, I'm sure with others are due to meet her in, in the coming weeks and, and I, I think we know that the first chair was ineffective, uh, uh, disengaged in the real issues um, and too concerned with the, an irrelevant bun fight about functions. Um, and quite evidently, the, the police authority played catch up on the issues of stop and search and armed policing, and in fact, uh, very unhelpful in their, their, their own role with the, the report on armed policing and, and stop and search. The second chair became ineffective and certainly was inappropriate with a fellow board member, entirely unacceptable, and um, has now uh, been involved in um, facilitating gardening leave for, for the chief constable, who, in my view, should be suspended. And that failure in itself has caused disaffection because people want fairness and they want equity. And uh, that's not always been the case. I alluded to the historic position in regard to allegations of misconduct, which if they were in junior ranks, they would have been construed as inferring criminality and how they were uh, set aside in the past. Um, there has been a frailty in, in consultation. Um, and what I would uh, urge Police Scotland is to understand where their frailties are. And they are in openness and transparency. And that's not more graphically shown in the narration uh, to a matter which is the subject of ongoing uh, consideration by the, the uh, police committee, and that is the counter-corruption unit, where they're stringing out, we now have three other forces involved, and the public quite rightly go, if that's how they treat their own, how are they likely to treat us? So I think we need to put a, draw a line under that. Um, what we need to do, what we need to do is recognise that there are elements of policing that are best dealt with at a strategic level. These are counter-terrorism, these are 
um, organised crime, and these are uh, some of the uh, firearms issues uh, and human trafficking. Um, and that, that has to be informed by local policing. And one of the good bits in the legislation was the local policing plan. So I would want a situation where the local policing plan, accepting that there is the strategic level of stuff, which isn't just within Scotland, of course, it's within the islands of the, the, the United Kingdom and beyond a dimension, but local policing is crucial. And we need to get to the situation. I've repeatedly asked about devolving uh, the, the resources, and that's not simply the money, because of course the bulk of resources is salaries, but devolving decision-making. And that can be about devolving decision-making about some of the resources, because there's been a centralization of the supervisory structure in some of the specialist units. We need a situation that applied in uh, Northern Constabulary, where bizarrely some people will think that the two police officers who police the island of Barra were responsible for their own overtime budget. Who better place to say that we, we, we require to work longer tonight, there's a couple of dances on or whatever. Now we're maybe well short of that, but what we do need is a situation where appropriate policing is taking place at an appropriate level and appropriately being um, uh, monitored. And of course, there's no point in scrutinizing if there's nothing to scrutinize, which has led to some disengagement from some of the, the, the local bodies. That should be the bedrock. We should be doing it the other way. What we should be talking about is how effective local policing has delivered these very good results. So I don't think the model in itself is wrong. We need to push it down and have genuine local policing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finney. I call on Claire Baker to close for Labour. Four minutes, please, Ms. Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. This has been a wide-ranging debate, arguably far too much to consider in the time we have before us. There have been comments that there is a romantic notion that everything was good in the past. I do recognise that we now have in place uh, more consistent procedures, we have national measures and we have more scrutiny, but with this comes greater responsibility. And Jackie Bailey, as convener of the Audit Committee, did highlight the well-documented weaknesses we are seeking to address. And while today is focused on structure, we have all recognised the hard work of officers, but we would do well to acknowledge the recent evaluation of police and fire reform, which found that morale among officers is low, with many no longer considering it a job for life. And although Police Scotland's budget is being protected in real terms, the survey also found that Scotland's police officers have become less visible to the public. And we've all had complaints about response times for uh, number 101. And while I think a debate about governance and scrutiny is valuable and relevant, this is what is really important. There have been some persistent issues around increasing local responsibility. It has been argued that the centralisation of policing has been to the detriment of local policing. And the government's motion does talk about the scope for improvement in the way current accountability models work, particularly with regard to engaging local interests and national government, but it hasn't detailed how this will be progressed or how this will be developed. And local accountability is identified as a weakness across the chamber. So how do we address it? How can we increase scrutiny at this level and the level of accountability? And I can see that the government can argue that scrutiny of policing is stronger than it has ever been, given that the SPA exists. But we have, and we have a parliamentary committee. But there are weaknesses which are well documented. And it's taken FOIs, investigative journalists, questioning academics to shine a light on a number of these issues, including stop and search, including the financial arrangements of the British Transport Police merger, including the recent suspension of officers. And I appreciate much of what the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening statement, but the protection of frontline officers has led to a significant reduction in support staff, making it difficult for officers to do their job. So I can't completely accept his argument over protecting the service. And while there is much I agree with in John Finney's amendment, it is too prescriptive for us to um, support today. Um, a number of me uh, members mentioned political interference and you know, the Acting Chief Constable Ian Livingston is recognised as an experienced, intelligent and highly skilled officer and he has our thanks for taking on this role at this time. His calls over less political interference at the weekend is interpreted as a call for less political debate, but it's not the opposition parties who have been identified as overly influencing policing or interfering in the role of the SPA, it is the government. We need greater clarity over roles and responsibilities in this area. Uh, the Green Amendment also talks about uh, the need for scrutiny of more controversial decisions. And if we compare what is routinely published in England and Wales around policing, there is much more information available in the public domain. And I appreciate there are issues with the legacy forces and the way in which information is collected, old technology which is incompatible, but we should have a strategy to deal with this. We should have an ambition to be more open and transparent, and I believe that that approach would help build confidence in police actions and decisions. 
While the creation of Police Scotland was a move to increase efficiencies, to look to protect public services in difficult financial times, to bring consistency to the police response throughout Scotland and strengthen specialist policing to respond to growing challenges such as human trafficking, serious and organised crime and online fraud, its creation did bring a different dynamic to policing in Scotland. It did bring with it greater political scrutiny. And the intensity that is placed on the Chief Constable makes it a fairly unique job within Scotland's public sector. And the role of the SPA there to provide checks and balance is sometimes seen as an alternative power base. So I believe that increasing both capacity and devolution in both these organisations could be a good thing that we need to seriously consider. Thank you. Thank you. Call on Margaret Mitchell to close for Conservatives. Ms Mitchell, four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Almost five years ago, Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012 led to the creation of Police Scotland. At that time, serious concerns were expressed about the, lack, about the fact that no full business case had been carried out and about the lack of checks and balances in the Act's provisions as Scotland's eight regional forces moved to one single force. Today it is evident that these misgivings, swept aside by the then Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Cab uh, Kenny McCaskill, in much the same way as the current Cabinet Secretary has attempted to do, have come home to roost. The estimated efficiency savings which the Scottish Government asserted would be realised have instead translated into a deficit. The SPA has a remit to scrutinise the governance of the new single force and to hold the Chief, Chief Constable to account. So the Cabinet Secretary is correct. There has been more scrutiny. But the point is that time and again, the SBA have been found to be on the back foot, having become aware of a problem after it has imploded in the public domain. I therefore very much welcome the appointment of Susan Deacon as the new SPA Chair. However, the fact is that she is the third person in less than five years to occupy the post tells its own story. I wish Susan well in her post. However, as she settles into her role, I once again seek an assurance from the Cabinet Secretary that she or any other holder of the office should not have to rely on the goodwill of the government ministers to continue in her post. In other words, it's now time for the 2012 Act, and in particular the appointment process, to be revisited to ensure that the Parliament has, uh, as a whole selects and crucially reappoints the SPA chair. The creation of Police Scotland meant that rather than having eight police commanders, there is now only one. On one hand, this puts all the power in the hands of one individual, and on the other hand, it leaves that individual potentially vulnerable to shoulder all the criticism for the failures within the force. Perhaps it's not surprising, therefore, that within less than five years, Scotland is seeking a third chief constable to fill that post. This hardly inspires confidence in the Act's provisions and is again a powerful argument for revisit revisiting these provisions. Regardless of the difficulties experienced within Police Scotland, the Scottish Police Federation has done sterling work in bringing to the fore the issues of concern affecting frontline police officers on a daily basis. These officers continue to do an outstanding job as the responders of first and last resort. Despite this, their issues of concern have all too often been ignored by the government. This includes the loss of localism, which has been a feature of the centralised force. Examples of which include the introduction of 101 num the 101 number and the closure of local police counters and stations and, and um, the centralisation of um, control rooms. More generally, the demands of frontline officers have not been acknowledged or reflected in the government's crime statistics given only one in five incidents attended by the police results in a crime being recorded. In conclusion, I support the amendment in Liam Kerr's name and call on the Cabinet Secretary to take responsibility in addressing the problems the provisions of this legislation has produced. Thank you. I call Michael Matheson to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I've uh, listened uh, uh, very closely to a range of the comments which have been made uh, this afternoon. I want to turn to uh, some of the points which have been raised by uh, members in the course of their contribution, although I won't be able to touch upon all of the 
uh, issues which have been raised and given the limited time which we have available to us. Yeah, Lee MacArthur, in his uh, uh, opening uh, statement in this particular debate, it raised a number of issues from armed policing, stop and search, call handling through to local uh, police plans. And I want to pick up on several of these issues. Uh, there's no doubt there was issues of concern raised about how Police Scotland had taken forward its deployment of uh, armed police officers uh, in the early stages of Police Scotland's creation. An issue was raised by uh, John Finney on an ongoing uh, basis. But I'm sure that members would also recognise the way in which Police Scotland have gone about dealing with issues relating to armed policing in recent times uh, has been very different to that process in the past, recognising uh, that they need to engage much more early, uh, earlier in considering these issues and to make sure that local elected members have a view on these matters before any final decisions are made. And I'm sure that members would welcome the way in which Police Scotland have taken this forward. On the matter of uh, stop and search that Liam MacArthur uh, made uh, reference to on a number of, point, a number of occasions during his uh, speech, uh, the member will also recognise that that's an issue which I've taken forward uh, through the uh, expert group that I appointed under John Scott to consider these matters. Uh, we are now in a much more robust, effective position as a result of the work I instructed on that particular matter uh, with regards to how Police Scotland uh, conduct these issues. And on the issue of uh, call handling, there is absolutely no doubt uh, there have been a number of uh, significant issues in relating to, relating to uh, call handling. But the member will also recognise that having instructed HMICS to conduct a deep review of the way in which call handling has been taken for within Police Scotland. There are a number of recommendations, some 30 recommendations that were set out, have been taken forward by Police Scotland in a very consistent, methodical way. To the point that almost uh, 27 of those recommendations have now been discharged, uh, with the three outstanding ones uh, still to be uh, completed, although good progress has been made uh, on those issues. And I think it's important to highlight, though, that when Police Scotland are making improvements in a system that deals with almost 4 million calls a year, that it's not helpful that they then find themselves being attacked for collating information relating to notable incidents, which was one of the recommendations from HMICS, to make sure that where mistakes are made, they'll learn from that, to then find themselves being attacked for the very improvements they're making in it in order to try and make sure they learn from where mistakes are made is simply not helpful. And it's that type of politicisation of policing that does not support police officers and the organisation in trying to drive through these reforms. I've got no time for it. I've got to make progress. And an issue of local policing plans, can I say to Liam MacArthur, that is something that's already taken forward. Local policing plans for each local authority area, which allows for engagement through the local scrutiny panels. Can I turn now to Liam MacArthur's point in relation to uh, policing structures? I must confess that the Tories are not in a strong place when it comes to policing structures, given the mess that they have in England and Wales. And it was a speech of contradictions when one minute it was talking about how we need to make sure that policing is uh, apolitical, although there's not a day goes past where he doesn't tell me that I should roll up my sleeves and get in there and start running the police uh, service. And if the member is committed to the idea of being 100% behind police officers in the job they're doing, supporting a motion here today that's supporting the position of having no confidence in Police Scotland is a very bizarre and very strange way in which to go about that. And I suspect the member will come to regret that in due course. Can I say to Claire Baker's comments regarding Susan Deacon? I think Susan Deacon is someone who will bring significant leadership to the role of the SPA chair. And although she may feel that she is hamstrung by some of the provisions that she has to operate within at this present time. We will wait to see how Susan Deacon gets on in her position as chair. And if she is raising specific issues with me, I will give them due consideration. What I can also do, though, is I can assure Alex Cole Hamilton that the appointment of Susan Deacon is more than appointing a personality. Yeah, Susan here. Deacon was appointed on her ability, and I believe she has the ability to do the job as well. Can I also turn to the issue that the member raised, Claire Baker raised, in relation to the strategic policing plan, and that's why ministers are accountable uh, for this. It, I think the member may be referring to the strategic policing priorities. The strategic policing priorities which are set down by government are actually through a public consultation exercise that takes place over a number of months and are agreed with COSLA. It was actually launched in partnership with COSLA, setting out what those priorities should be. Localism, protecting local communities, it's then operationally for the police service and the SPA to make sure that that's then translated into action on the ground. And the approach that we took when I redrafted those particular strategic policing priorities was welcomed by COSLA as showing much more commitment to joint working with local authority on these issues. Can I say, sign officer, I felt that in John Finney's contribution here this afternoon, we got a dose of reality because the strength of our police service here in Scotland is the people within the organisation, the individual police officers and the staff. 
And I'm, I see on a daily basis their dedication to our local communities, and I'm confident of the strength that we continue to have in the leadership of Police Scotland. Thank you. I call Willie Rennie to wind up for Liberal Democrats. Six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I saw that the First Minister had taken the trouble this morning to draw attention to an extended tweet from Callum Steele of the Scottish Police Federation. Perhaps our debate today has touched some of our raw nerve with the First Minister, and I do understand that Callum Steele was a strong supporter of the centralisation of Police Scotland and has found it difficult to come to terms with the failings of that reform. But the Scottish Government is responsible for the budget of Police Scotland. Lord Smith did not merge the British Transport Police with Police Scotland. And ministers knew what they were doing when they centralised the police. They knew that they would be required to pay VAT. So there is no point in drawing attention to any other weaknesses with anybody else when the weaknesses are squarely with the Scottish Government. We have been repeatedly told to pipe down, not to ask questions, to get behind the government. Even the acting chief constable tried it at the weekend. But after all the chaos of the last four years, the M9 crash response, armed police on routine duties, the loss of experienced civilian staff, the imposition of an alien target culture, stop and search, the closure of call centres, all of this and more. I'm glad that we warned about all this. I'm glad that we spoke up and I'm glad that we were not cowed into silence by the SNP. I have to say I was amused by Fulton McGregor's uh, contribution. A poll of SNP members on WhatsApp has found that the SNP government were doing rather well uh, on the police. Not just now. Liam MacArthur referred to another attempt to silence us last week. It involves the tragic death of Elizabeth Bow in St Andrews. Liberal Democrat councillor Margaret Kennedy asked for Fife Council to receive a report on the case so it could be debated after Perk found major errors in the handling of Elizabeth's call. This request for a report was denied by the SNP councillor responsible. He referred councillor Kennedy to the BBC iPlayer to watch First Minister's questions. Now watching the BBC iPlayer and First Minister's question is no substitute for proper local accountability. And that shows what kind of sham we have with the 2012 Act. Now, Police Scotland has a budget of over £1 billion a year. It is responsible for keeping us safe. I pay tribute to the officers and the work that they do to keep us safe. It deserves proper scrutiny. But this government has not even given up any of its government chamber time to debate the state of Police Scotland. So as a party that has led the scrutiny of Police Scotland and the only party that voted against the centralisation, it is now again up to us to carve out that time for this to be debated. Now, I've been a long time critic of the centralisation of the police, but even I did not believe it would get to this stage. I did not think that the troubles of Police Scotland would endure for the whole four years since it was created and the devastating consequences since. We must conclude that we have no confidence in the structure of Police Scotland. Now, others have dwelled on today, quite rightly, the, the problems with Police Scotland over that time. Maurice Corey, Alex Cole Hamilton, Jackie Bailey, who made a good contribution, a really good contribution, Margaret Mitchell and others. They've identified the failings with Police Scotland, so I'm not going to dwell on that. But I did find John Finney's defence of the current police structure extraordinary especially as his two colleagues in the last parliament voted against the 2012 Act. We have our preferred model. We have a preferred model, a comprehensive, adequately funded policing plan for each local authority area in Police Scotland, developed and agreed by communities and councillors and with the responsibility of a local senior police officer. The membership of the Scottish Police Authority to become Scottish Parliament's appointments on a vote of two thirds of this Parliament Mr. in a majority in last minute and in a similar so. way to other commissioners to ensure a balanced and representative authority and to remove the role of the Justice Secretary in making appointments. The powers of the Chief Constable should be defined in statute to reflect that the historic tripart structure has been changed and that there is a need for a new democratic checks and balances to be created. The aim 
is to inject democracy back into our policing. These are our proposals. We need to build, however, a broader consensus, which is why we propose this independent commission, and I was pleased that some in the chamber were indicating support for that today. This is the kind of reset that Police Scotland needs. We have no confidence in the current structures, and therefore time has come for a change. And the reason for the change is clear. Members will recall the turf war between Stephen House and Vic Emery over who was in charge. That was a direct result of flawed legislation. Members will also recall the decision by Stephen House to put armed officer on routine duties without proper scrutiny. There was also the decision by the Chief Constable to impose detailed targets in a one-size-fits-all Strathclyde writ large approach to policing in Scotland. There's also the Audit Scotland report, which highlighted weak financial leadership of Police Scotland. We are told that police are accountable to local communities, but you just have to look at the Highlands, where they voted against armed policing on routine duties, and that was overruled by the Chief Constable. This is the sham of local accountability. That is why we need change yeah. for Police Scotland. We need change to the structures. That is the best way to back our police and back confidence into our police too. Thank you. That concludes the debate on justice. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. I have a very short suspension, but the front benches take their places, please.